Chronic inflammation functions as a causative factor in illness became apparent while he was director of a laboratory specializing in in vitro allergy and viral immunology testing. He began using metal detox methods in 1995 and research into the toxicity of mercury led to the observation that glutathione is a critical component of the defense against heavy metals. As glutathione also functions as a cell signal in the immune system, it may serve as a critical component linking toxicity from sources such as metals to immune dysfunction. So his presentation will review the basics, glutathione and its link to toxins, oxidative stress, and immune function. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Guilford. Well, welcome back, those of you who are here for the first part. You'll, you'll understand the second part a lot better. Those of you who weren't here are going to understand it in tissues and may be involved in a number of neurodegenerative problems. And finally, you get a loss of some of the uh, macrophage cells in the... Uh, the astrocytes act like um, tender ships for your neurons. Neurons are so highly specialized that they don't make their own antioxidants. Uh, astrocytes make the antioxidant for them and, and export uh, the components for the uh, neurons to make glutathione or have glutathione. Um, here's a picture of uh, hemoglobin. We were talking about that in the previous lecture. This is an artist's sculpture up in uh, Oregon um, in which that was the sculpture. It's a, um, the red ball is the um, iron in the middle of this hemoglobin. And um, you can see this uh, stainless steel uh, slowly corroding, or the non-stainless steel slowly, slowly uh, corroding, uh, creating an oxidative stress. So I think that gives you an example. I can tell everybody all the time, everybody says, what's oxidative stress? Well, that's rust on your on the gate um, of your of going into your backyard. And here it is depicted by an artist. Um, here's an interesting thing. Um, an article that shows that 36% of the patients with chronic diseases have low glutathione including cancer and gastrointestinal problems, cardiovascular and musculoskeletal. Um, just so you don't think I'm making all this up. So here's this list. We talk about autism. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about cystic fibrosis. The liver makes seven times more glutathione in its cells than any other cell um, because it's involved so much in detoxification so that when you have liver problems, it's likely that your glutathione is depleted. Parkinson's disease gets depleted not so much systemically. Some people do have a low glutathione in their blood, but they get deficient in the substantia nigra in their brain cells and the ones that are producing dopamine for locomotion and it's just not available on a regular basis and you know they get the jerky movement or they can't move at all. And we've had a number of people who are using the liposomal glutathione. Uh, oh. I do have an interest in a company that, uh, a financial interest in a company that makes uh, a product that's covered in my talk. And I apologize for not telling you earlier, but I will use the generic term liposomal glutathione. Um, a number of people who've used liposomal glutathione report improvement in Parkinson's. Not all of them. And we had one dramatic case of a, a doctor in his 80s who called us and he had started on a teaspoon of the lip, 400 milligrams in the teaspoon of the liposomal glutathione. <laughs> And uh, he said he, he felt even more heavy, couldn't really, he was having trouble standing up, he's in his 80s, and moving, he couldn't walk because of Parkinson's. So we told him to start on a little tiny dose, start on a quarter teaspoon, and he worked up to a quarter teaspoon three times a day, and he could walk. He could go for little walks with his wife for the first time in a decade, and he found that actually decreasing his medication, uh, his, the uh, tremor diminished. So he was quite a happy customer. We had another lady who had taken dozens of IV glutathione for her Parkinson's who reported no improvement at all and um, was told she probably didn't use it properly and just by coincidence at that time started the liposomal glutathione and she started on a teaspoon and worked up to a teaspoon twice a day and all of a sudden she could get back in the car and go for a drive where she had not felt comfortable doing that because of her Parkinson's before. The intriguing thing is that she also found that if she'd like to meet with her girlfriends uh, a few nights a week and have a martini and found that she needed an extra dose of glutathione on those days to function properly. And that gives you insight into the liver function and what happens without uh, alcohol. Alcohols get um, 
uh, turned into aldehydes. It kind of makes me wonder, is it the alcohol or is it the aldehydes? Aldehydes um, cause, it's, that's like formaldehyde, for example. They uh, deplete glutathione, and that's the mechanism by which they cause tissue damage. Um, we all know about formaldehyde being used to you know, make tissues stiffer, and that's what they do in embalming. But um, it depletes your glutathione. And um, um, so if any of you go out tonight and want to stop by the booth in the morning, I often uh, give out little shots of glutathione in the morning, and if you have a headache, you can test it out. Are you volunteering? <laughs> Be my guest. Ah, yeah. I, I don't know that answer. Um, that's an intriguing question. I don't have the answer to. Again, a lot of these things, as long as your detox system is working, they're not a problem. But then, we've probably all encountered people with chemical sensitivities who, a little, with a little bit of something, goes a long way. Alzheimer's disease has, uh, especially men, have been noted to have low glutathione in their blood with Alzheimer's disease. I don't have the whole answer in this. Um, some people call it Alzheimer's disease the diabetes of the brain. What does that mean exactly? I I'm not sure yet. I'm going to touch on that in a second. We're going to talk about atherosclerosis. There's an interesting study out there that I didn't reference in here, which puts people in what's called a glucose clamp, and that's an infusion of insulin that keeps them at a steady state of glucose. And what they found was that after a big spike in their glucose, they'd release some inflammatory mediators, cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-12 and IL-8 and those sorts of things. But if they gave them three spikes within 18 hours, they would get a huge release of cytokines, um, chronic inflammation. Uh, which they correlated with the possibility that this is what's creating the inflammatory mechanism that causes vascular disease in people with diabetes. The same study they found if they hooked them up to a pump where they got a continuous supply of glut reduced glutathione during that experiment, they would not get the release of inflammatory mediators. So that shows you the relationship with uh, glucose and glucose spiking and why it's so important to avoid glucose spiking but by the same token what the mechanism is just as we discussed in the last hour uh, depletion of glutathione leading to chronic inflammation so it brings new there was an article I, somebody just told me about this I missed it the first time around about Alzheimer's being the diabetes of the brain but all of a sudden this starts to make sense you get it's a neuroinflammatory disease possibly triggered by a number of mechanisms I mentioned viral disease in the first uh, lecture in a chronic virus, and I'll tell you my personal experience. I'm not recommending that this is a therapy, of course. It's not been studied. But I've seen a number of people with acute viruses who start taking one or two teaspoons of the liposomal glutathione um, an hour with the onset of a, a tough uh, an influenza. They either can calm the symptoms down within a few hours or feel good enough to go back to work the next day. It, we learned this from the children with cystic fibrosis, so I'm going to come to this in just a minute, and I'll, come, I'll, I'll expound more on that in a minute. So tissues exposed to oxidation require higher levels of glutathione, and toxins such as mercury use up glutathione quickly. Now you're all up to date on the same page. You ready? <laughs> Fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. So what tissues are exposed to oxidation? Well, the obvious ones, the respiratory tract, lungs, sinuses. Uh, you don't think about it, but your gastrointestinal tract is because you're burning your food when you use it, you're oxidizing it. The lung can concentrate glutathione in its epithelial lining by 140 times the normal level in cells. Now, it's not exactly, I love this article. It's not exactly sure how or why the lung does that. Well, I'm, we understand why. I'm not sure how it does that. It, it has an active mechanism to excrete the glutathione. Um, unless you have um, a respiratory disease. And so an extracellular lung fluid, the fluid lining the alveoli in the lung, the glutathione is low. Uh, ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome, but it's low in all of these uh, 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 known diseases to uh, affect the lung. And I had the occasion when I first started working with the liposomal glutathione to have the parent of a child with cystic fibrosis call me. She was working with a at that time, there was a lab in the Midwest that would do glutathione levels, and her child with CF uh, had low glutathione in the red blood cells, and the lab director told her to call me. And I was sitting there with this sample in my hand. I mean, talk about uh, uh, coincidence. 
And um, I said, well, I think this might work in that situation. I'm not sure why. I had to go back and read about cystic fibrosis some more. And around that time, uh, a lady named Valerie Hudson, who had a couple of kids with CF, had gotten a paper published in a free radical uh, journal that talked about the role of glutathione. And what happens in the kids with cystic fibrosis is they're missing what's called the transmembrane regulator. So they call it cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. And what this does is uh, move negatively charged ions out of cells. And that's why these kids end up with uh, chloride on their skin. Um, I think it has something to do with moving the chloride into cells too, but um, the accepted statement is it moves uh, these things out and that's why their skin tastes salty. But uh, glutathione is a strongly negatively charged uh, material. And that accounts for why plain glutathione may not be absorbed because its negative charge doesn't allow it to cross the membranes and or there are enzymes which chew up glutathione before it can get in. And we'll talk about uh, the advantage that liposomal glutathione may have in that setting. So here we have uh, in the kids with CF, they have lung problems, GI tract problems, their brain function remains normal, uh, unlike some other children with problems with low glutathione because they're able to make glutathione in their cells, they just can't export it to the sites where they need it. So that's really quite interesting, um, you know, if you just look at the basic science of a CF child versus a child with autism who has low glutathione systemically, uh, the impact that this has. So in the past they've tried uh, NAC and that will raise the glutathione in the white cells, but uh, these, this kiddo had tried that, they tried whey protein, IV infusions were not an option. And here we are showing her red blood cell glutathione before treatment on, on your left and um, after treatment with a liposomal form of glutathione on the right, it brought her glutathione way up. And over the three week period, her lungs cleared up. So here's a picture of the liposome um, with the fatty um, bubble outside, which means it's gonna be readily absorbed into the um, system. The body will absorb these fatty materials very, uh, even if you're, I've had some people with uh, full blown celiac disease who I put on this liposomal glutathione, and they will abs absorb the glutathione even though their villi are no longer um, as active and they're not absorbing other materials. And then the glutathione is maintained in the reduced state and made available inside the lipid bubble. Here's a, an electron micrograph showing these layers. You can see them, these little ridges there are the layers um, of the fatty material. So it turns out that uh, oxidation stress and inflammation are almost synonymous. While they're not from the biochemical concept, this fellow Raman uh, wrote this article and showed that no matter what the site, he was talking about lung, and specific characteristics of the inflammatory response, even in different diseases, they're all characterized by the recruitment and activation of inflammatory cells leading to an oxidant imbalance, a, a loss of antioxidant support. So uh, this is true in the lung. He, that's what uh, Dr. Rahman was writing about. Um, here's this kiddo, uh, this, that slides slightly out of um, order, I apologize. This, this is a second child with cystic fibrosis in which uh, her presentation was primarily gastrointestinal tract. And at age, um, I think it was around 18 months, her weight, which had been pretty good, started to level out and she went from 50 percentile down to 25th percentile. And she had been on NAC and plain glutathione and when she started the liposomal glutathione, within three months her weight went up to normal where it has stayed. Both these kids with CF have remained stable for over uh, two years now. Um, they, yes, they get some problems. They get, uh, you know, if they get a bad infection they have to go on antibiotics. But this is contrasted to most of these kids that are maintained on antibiotics on a constant basis. And the first one I mentioned was examined by a fellow named Warren Warwick at uh, the University of Minnesota. And he's, he, he revolutionized cystic fibrosis by telling everybody to do chest percussion and loosen up all that thick mucus. And his, the kids in his clinic live longer. He, he sits there all day telling these kids, don't despair, you're gonna go to college. You know, you're, you're gonna have a life, don't give up. And I sat there in the clinic with him uh, listening to these kids with CF all afternoon, and they sound all like they have pneumonia. And, I mean, I was startled. I said, don't you have to treat this child? And he goes, oh, that's the way they sound. Well, he remembered this one kiddo that um, came to see him that was on my product because, um, whoops, anyway, on the product that I use. 
but he um, <laughs> He said, I never saw a child with CF have a normal uh, lung exam before. It was very, very notable, and he'd been doing that for 30 years. So there's something going on in terms of it was very stimulating for me. So here's Rahman's observation about uh, e equating inflammation and oxidation stress. And so what happens in the lung, um, here you have someone who doesn't smoke over here. They have a normal level of glutathione. But when they start smoking, their glutathione is ramped up. This is what happens when you hit an oxidizing stress. If you're normal and you have the capacity to turn that methylation cycle back on, you're going to make glutathione. But when you get sick, uh, here's a stable COPD, per, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease person. They have an elevated level, but not quite as high. But when they get sick during a severe episode, it goes down. And if they're lucky during a very severe episode, it may ramp up just a little bit. So how do we know this? In a way, we know this um, um, because of these people with um, acute respiratory distress syndrome in the adults, they will have the lowest level. So if this person with uh, obstructive pulmonary disease gets really sick and ends up in the ICU on a ventilator, their glutathione and their extracellular lung fluid is very low. Again, you'll see the smokers have 163% of normal. Well, without adequate glutathione, the lung tissue becomes predisposed to injury and they have an increase in lipid peroxidation. And that, was, that will show up whether your lipids are getting peroxidated in your brain or in your lung, they'll start being excreted in your urine. And so that's one way to monitor people who may have um, oxidative stress. Um, you can also get the same mechanism in your GI tract, and people with Crohn's disease, for example, will have, and other inflammatory bowel diseases, will have uh, diminished glutathione synthesis in, in those patients, and these are published observations. So we talked about the link with uh, low glutathione and autism. Here's the uh, reference, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, December 2004, Jill James. Any of those words will pull up this article. And we talked about this, so I'm going to kind of fly through here. Go ahead, there's a question in front. What is the relationship? Is NAC a precursor of glutathione? It is. In this methylation cycle, moving the carbon around, you make homocysteine, and as long as that is going around, it will make cysteine available. NAC is N-acetylcysteine, which is a stable form of cysteine that then can be combined with glutamine and glycine to form glutathione. So and it becomes the rate limiting factor, and that's why uh, NAC will help raise your glutathione. Should you, if you're trying to keep your glutathione up, is it good to put NAC in as part of your regimen? I, I think it is. I, I think it is. Um, um, as we discussed in the uh, first one, though, if you have a lot of mercury or an acute, it was documented that excess alcohol in one study and sepsis in another mouse study would block the, this enzyme availability, so you won't make glutathione right when you need it the most. And instead, you end up making taurine, and that's why that kiddo that I saw that had mercury and chronic virus had a high taurine and, and a low glutathione. So NAC is good. Um, don't misunderstand me. And also, I should have said this at the start of both lectures. I'm not telling you that you need glutathione without the other nutrients. I'm telling you the role that glutathione plays in maintaining the system. The irony is, I mean, you you should, you know, you need uh, magnesium and B6 to make this, um, for this reaction right here. Uh, you need B5 and zinc to keep glutathione in the reduced state. But what I found is that, I found articles now that show that uh, that regeneration of glutathione can't keep up during an acute illness in the GSSG, the oxidized form. When it piles up in the mitochondria and in the cell, it's excreted out into the bloodstream. So the ratio of glutathione oxidized to the reduced form to the oxidized form becomes very critical in determining your ability to, to maintain normal function. Um, so this cycle can be disrupted by mercury affects it up here, turning, uh, allowing B12 and folate to work to create methionine. And I think it hurts it right here. And when you get acutely ill, I don't think you can make glutathione uh, especially if your reservoir is depleted. And I think that's why these people with lung disease go along fine or why someone that suddenly gets, uh, who gets a bad flu all of a sudden will decline and go into respiratory distress. They don't have the capacity of the reservoir and or the mechanisms to make adequate glutathione. Does that make sense? 
So we'll move this around. We talked about this before, but I just wanted, it's so important, I thought I'd show someone who'd not been at the first lecture. Um, when you get that blocked in the autistic kids, you get low cysteine and low glutathione that does not improve until you replace methylated B12, but more particularly that and glutathione. Um, so we'll move through there. And we talked about uh, free radicals being made during the production of energy, and that will cause oxidative stress. Well, there's oxidative stress in the outside world. And here's a picture of oxidative stress, again, in the outside world, but this gives you a picture of what happens in your membranes when you get damage to your cell membrane. It's just like tanning leather. That's what mercury does. Um, that's how it got used to make the felt hats. They were uh, tanning the felt, making it stiff. and um, so it'll make it brittle, and eventually those membranes fall apart, and when they do, then the cell crumbles. You can use other antioxidants to help maintain that, vitamin C, vitamin E, the polyphenols, as you heard this morning. But we're going to talk about the fact that glutathione peroxidase plays a critical role in the removal of a lot of these free radicals, especially the hydroxyl radical, and that turns out to play a big role in atherosclerosis. So the question inevitably comes up, if it plays a role in all these diseases, why haven't we heard about it? And the reason is that while there's 77,000 articles or more now in the um, single word search under glutathione in PubMed, um, there is no article on oral administration of glutathione that I can find except the one that shows that it's not absorbed into the body. There's a handful of articles showing that um, IV glutathione can be beneficial. It's particularly in Parkinson's disease, for example, it's a very dramatic one that many people are familiar with. Now, um, we were talking earlier about when the ratio of oxidized glutathione and reduced glutathione uh, change with the uh, loss of reduced glutathione. Um, that, art, that relationship was shown um, here by a fellow named Ashfock in 2006 using that ratio to identify healthy individuals who were at risk of progression of artery disease. And he did this by measuring progression of thickening in their carotid arteries. So that's an indication of how this happens, even in healthy people. And then the second article, uh, Di Chiari showed that people who have already had a heart attack, their level of plasma, reduced glutathione, was a standalone predictor of progression of uh, artery disease in the form of having an acute complication within the first 15 months after having some kind of revascularization procedure in their coronary arteries. So the concept of glutathione and oxidation stress is starting to creep into the mainstream literature. Um, my experience with the liposomal glutathione suggests to me that this is going to become um, a very useful tool for clinical work. But I want to show you first an animal study that shows the importance of glutathione in maintaining your, your lipids. And this was done by a, a group in the lab of uh, Professor uh, Michael Avaram, who has published, uh, co-authored over 300 papers on vascular disease and lipid metabolism. And one of the things that he showed is that if you take um, human blood, the first step was to see, to check its antioxidant characteristics. And so he took a tubes of human blood, which uh, LDL cholesterol had been concentrated, and then added copper sulfate in increasing amounts. And this is a standard laboratory technique for increasing the oxidative stress in the system and creating uh, oxidized LDL. And he found that the uh, addition of liposomal glutathione in the test tube directly slowed the progression of oxidation of LDL. And that led him also to do some work which demonstrated that glutathione peroxidase is embedded natively or naturally in the LDL particle. Now, we've all recently heard about a number of trials that have um, been uh, stopped, one in particular which showed that they were trying to uh, lower LDL and raise HDL through a, uh, blocking a mechanism uh, that occurs naturally. And the patients actually had more problems, so they stopped the trial. And so the whole issue of LDL and its role that it plays, the other one is the question of 
the fact that you can lower LDL to the accepted levels and people still have heart attacks. It's not just the elevation of LDL that's the problem. And I would submit to you that with the finding that oxidized, that LDL itself has glutathione peroxidase in it, that um, the progression of atherosclerosis may be due to the oxidation of LDL. So Dr. Abraham then took the liposomal glutathione and administered it to uh, mice that had their APOE protein knocked out. And that APOE knockout is a classic model for atherosclerosis. People with APOE4, which doesn't have as many of the sulfur groups in it as the other two components, are also prone to both mercury excess and artery disease and a number of diseases. But when it's knocked out completely, these mice uh, form glutathione, uh, excuse me, form uh, atherosclerosis very rapidly where normal mice do not. And he was able to show that the uh, progression of atherosclerosis was slowed uh, by um, the presence of the liposomal glutathione in their diet every day, in their water every day. I, I, you can, I can provide you a copy of the article for those that want to read the article. If, uh, um, and I'll put my email address up there again, or you can stop me outside or, or in the exhibit hall and uh, give me your card, and I will send you a copy of the article. Uh, or you can look it up on the net. But what it looks like is that, and we're going to go into a little more detail, but the macrophage, um, if it, it doesn't really ingest a lot of uh, normal LDL. And if it does, if there's an adequate antioxidant system, it plays a big role in turning that into HDL and returning, and returning LDL and HDL back to the liver. But look what happens when the macrophage gets a hold of oxidized LDL. It turns out that um, it's kind of like eating buttered popcorn. Uh, the, the, the macrophage cell is supposed to be cleaning up. It has no way to stop ingesting. Its receptors won't stop ingesting oxidized LDL. It's like a defect in the system, if you will. If you have oxidized LDL, this will pick it up, and it becomes so engorged with cholesterol and oxidized cholesterol, they call it a foam cell. And they didn't know what these were initially, and then they found out they were macrophages filled with fat. And like, um, not unlike myself after the second uh, bag of popcorn, if you're sitting there um, eating popcorn, watching TV or something, if it's, um, you feel kind of bloated. And so here we have a cross-section of an artery with some red blood cells there, and here's the arterial lining, and I left a little space that wouldn't normally be there with the smooth muscles and the artery lining. And we'll look at just one section of that. These uh, foam oxidized LDL-filled uh, foam cells then uh, it turns out that it increased cholesterol and excess oxidized LDL compromised the ability of the macrophage to move. Its locomotive mechanism, the actin and that sort of thing, is compromised. So they feel bloated. They don't feel good. They have to get out of the blood flow. Normal, I should have pointed this out, normal macrophages float around both in the blood but also right on the membrane. I've seen a video of these uh, macrophages running back and forth while the blood vessels are just sailing by the big red blood cells. The macrophage is down there right on that surface cleaning things up and will then congregate below the surface of the lining, the endothelium of the artery, and begin to accumulate. And as they accumulate then they create a little bump in the artery which progressively gets bigger until it actually begins to narrow the width of some arteries. So the blood cells then start to get sludgy going through there. And that's the classic chronic uh, obstruction mechanism of atherosclerosis. And if that endothelial lining ruptures enough, then all of a sudden the immune system comes in contact with the oxidized LDL. Let me just finish this thought. And the oxidized LDL is very immunogenic. It calls in a reaction just like uh, a lipopolysaccharide toxin uh, were there. And you get a big inflammation followed by platelet aggregation, and you get, you get this acute clot that you see on TV at night that uh, obstructs the mechanism. So that whole pathway is triggered by the presence of oxidized, and perpetuated by the presence of oxidized LDL. Go ahead. There's a, a test that we do at an NMR test, uh, where it looks at the particle number of the cholesterol, cool. uh, as opposed to just looking at LDL. Oh, right. We'll see. It, it has something to do with why the more particles I haven't quite um, 
um, figured the relationship out there yet. Um, I'm just going based on the published paper on the oxidation of LDL, and I did a lot of literature search on oxidized LDL. Oxidized LDL has been, and so I don't know exactly with the particle count how that relates to the oxidation. What they're talking about is the lipoprotein particles compared to the LDL cholesterol itself. And the LDL, lipo, the, the lipoprotein carries the LDL, and so I, I'm not sure what those relationships are yet. I've inquired of one of the labs that does that test to help me uh, resolve that issue, and I uh, may be able to report on that another time. But the theory of oxidized LDL being the cause of um, arterial sclerosis and these plaques has been present since 1977, and the, the theory gained some acceptance but was thrown out when all the trials that are looking at various things like vitamin E and vitamin C have not had consistent results. They'll get some results at different times, but there's been no consensus of agreement that uh, um, the um, that oxidation stress is the answer and I presented this to some researchers who are getting some interest and um, uh, we're going to hopefully be able to look at that a little further. But I suspect then that what's happening is that it's the, I didn't put the other slide in there, that, that because glutathione is the only substrate that will work with glutathione peroxidase, the enzyme that's in um, LDL cholesterol, that just adding vitamin C won't cause that enzyme to function. What it will do is cause glutathione to become reduced and, have, and make glutathione more available but if you lose your glutathione in that system, or if you lose your glutathione peroxidase, which mercury also does, then you're going to have this progression of disease, and that explains why Salonen and some other people have written articles correlating the presence of mercury with uh, vascular disease, and it explains why these recent articles showing low glutathione is associated with the progression of vascular disease. So how does this relate to the dentist? No, we've got, we're going to have plenty of time for questions because I moved through that uh, uh, methylation of methionine real, real, real quickly. When are we over? 445 or 5? Oh, perfect. Okay. So how does this relate to the dentist? Well, uh, oral oxidative stress and inflammation uh, have been found in uh, periodontal disease, and here's a publication that speaks to that, in that uh, lower antioxidant capacity is found in saliva as well as increased uh, evidence of increased pr protein oxidation. And it's, uh, so it's found that the saliva has reduced antioxidant status and increased oxidative damage. For some reason, women showed up more than men in this particular study. I don't know why. Um, so the gingival crevical fluid showed a significantly um, lower level of uh, antioxidant in the periodontitis subjects compared to healthy, and this is yet another study, and that was, uh, again, using both saliva but also plasma and serum. So it's an indicator that it's not only happening locally in the mouth, it's also happening uh, systemically. And that kind of makes sense. If you don't have enough antioxidant floating around in your blood, you're not going to be able to produce it in the glands making saliva. So here's a subsequent study that shows that melatonin levels uh, very inversely with the degree of periodontal disease. So as periodontal disease get worse, salivary melatonin levels decreased. And uh, it's known that uh, systemic melatonin levels may influence uh, the ability to withstand bacterial insults. So they started talking, uh, this article reflects the fact that melatonin may act as a protector against free radicals in periodontal disease. It turns out melatonin is a terrific anti-inflammatory. It has four antioxidant uh, sites on it for each molecule, and it does not necessarily require a, um, an enzyme to work with. And it's a very efficient free radical scavenger, and it uh, turns out to have anti-inflammatory qualities. And um, it also has some other mechanisms. It stimulates synthesis of uh, type 1 collagen fibers and promotes bone formation, again, which would be really influential in the oral cavity after surgical procedures. And what they did is they took animals and uh, um, dogs and pulled their teeth and uh, did biopsies in the periodontal 
uh, disease, and they found that not only is the melatonin low, but if you apply melatonin there, you can improve it. Uh, there is a liposomal melatonin, which may have some utility in this area, although it itself has not been studied. It does provide melatonin. And so um, it looks like uh, melatonin itself, as well as your general antioxidant status, has uh, significant implications for dental disorders. And uh, diseases of the periodontum are known to be aggravated by increased free radicals and lower uh, uh, antioxidant status because they can't handle the microorganisms that are present in the plaque. And I think we understand that better now if you look at both the macrophage function with oxidized LDL and think of that same mechanism looking at bacteria releasing toxins creating oxidative stress. The macrophage just can't handle it if there's not enough antioxidant power available to it. Um, you can take it in uh, oral uh, melatonin, 3 and 5 milligrams, um, and also there is now a liposomal melatonin spray that you could apply directly to the, in a spray to the gums. Well, you got to remember melatonin will make you sleepy. So it's hard to take during the day, um, although some people can develop a tolerance. So the time to do it is take it at night and take, take some melatonin before you go to bed. Uh, there are protocols for treatment of cancer and that sort of thing because melatonin has anti-estrogenic effects where some people put their patients on huge doses of melatonin and have them take it during the day. So I, I assume they accommodate to the ability to, to, to um, withstand the sleep-inducing qualities of melatonin. The melatonin, liposomal melatonin spray that I use, many people feel sleepy. The other thing with melatonin is if you take it at night in the dark, it really works more efficiently than if you take it during the day when it's light and you're active. But uh, that's really the conversion to melatonin of serotonin. Melatonin itself will make you, potentially make you sleepy, so you have to watch out with the dosing. So if you recommend it, tell them to take it at night to help with sleep. Most of these people with antioxidant stress, that's another symptom. The people that have trouble falling asleep or waking up a lot during the night, uh, they're not making and maintaining enough melatonin. And um, here's the uh, articles on the benefit of applying melatonin to inflamed oral tissue in these dogs. Um, related to tooth removal, there's uh, two different studies. And um, then we come to the correlation of uh, what you're well aware of as dentists, the severity of periodontal disease correlates directly with uh, the presence of coronary artery disease probably mediated through the inf systemic uh, inflammation mechanism. Um, so periodontal disease predicts coronary artery disease stenosis, and I think you can understand why now, looking at the Avaron paper and um, the depletion of glutathione and the progression of uh, inability to manage the oxidized LDL. So. Is periodontal disease a local phenomenon or a manifestation of a systemic disease? This paper clearly, it's very recent. Journal Internal Medicine, I mean, that's big time medicine journal. Mainstream here in January 2008 is saying that uh, this looks like a systemic disease and you ought to be looking in the mouth and you can estimate the progression, the present, possible presence of coronary artery blockage. So there you go. So once again, the whole key here is the presence of the peroxidase in the LDL. It's also present on the, uh, another form of peroxidase is present in the membranes, the lipid membranes, and it probably is similarly dependent on, it. well it is, it's another form of glutathione peroxidase. So to keep your membranes from looking like that old shipwreck, you want to maintain your glutathione, reduce your metals to, to get rid of the uh, oxidative stress, maintain your glutathione during and after that mechanism. And whether you use uh, the precursor building blocks like NAC to build your glutathione or whey proteins, which has another form of cysteine in it, um, or the lipos or IV glutathione, or it's much easier to use the liposomal glutathione orally. Um, those are some things that you may want to consider in this particular setting because those of you working in the dental office, even if you don't use uh, mercury, may be exposed to it just um, polishing teeth and, uh, and or taking uh, mercury amalgams out. Somebody always wants to know about toxicity and in the mouth study um, they had to give five grams per kilogram 
uh, to, and it was a mechanical problem that caused the problem of the mouse stuffing all the glutathione into this poor mouse. It doesn't appear to be toxic. Um, the, the you know plain glutathione. This was done with plain glutathione in a liquid form. They were just had to, trying to find what the dose. They give it by gavage, and their whole point was they 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 weren't able to give enough to induce toxicity through an oral ingestion route. I have some unpublished data that shows that. Uh, um, glutathione is, the liposomal form of glutathione is much more effective in getting glutathione into the tissues than plain glutathione in a water-soluble form. And that's why there have not been any studies on plain oral glutathione in the literature all these years. Let's entertain some questions. Thank you for listening.